In the 1920s, a murder case caught the attention of New Yorkers. A young Italian immigrant called Catherine De Nino shot and killed the man who had raped her four years earlier. Let us examine the events leading up to the execution of her tormentor. Her father, Antonio Skipper, had brought his family to Harlem's Little Italy to start a new life with the hopes and dreams that all immigrants have in their adoptive lands. He worked hard to provide for his family, but after 10 years on new soil, his health gave out and he died, leaving his family to fend for themselves. To make ends meet and to be able to send the youngest daughter, Chiara, Catherine, to school, his widow, Maria, turned their home into a boarding house and worked additionally in a factory. The older children, Giulia, Salvatore and Rose, followed suit in order to supplement their weekly income. To further support the family, Catherine's mother brought her uncle, who was much younger than she, to stay in the family home. His name was Luigi Fino, and he was described as a handsome blonde Italian. He found work as a tile setter and was a diligent worker, who supported his wife and children in Italy, and to all outward appearances, was a great help to the Skipper family. One night, however, this veneer of respectability was shattered. While alone with Catherine, he attacked and raped her, smashing her cherished porcelain doll in the process. When Maria returned home from work, she found her 12-year-old daughter unconscious on the floor. When she came to consciousness again, she tearfully told her mother what outrage Luigi Fino had committed that evening. Catherine's mother immediately ordered Fino to pack his bags and leave. But not long after, it became apparent that Catherine was pregnant as a result of the attack. Fino made pressure to be allowed to return and help support the mother and child. Maria Schippo reluctantly agreed for the sake of the baby. Soon after, though, Maria desperately wanted rid of Fino, and one day told him that the baby had suddenly died. Ethan Catherine believed this after discovering the child absent when she returned home one day. After hearing this, Fino quickly disappeared from their life. Maria didn't report the rape to the authorities because she thought it would bring shame and stigma to the family. She was more worried about the scandal it would create than she was with her own daughter's predicament. Circumstances improved for Catherine in 1926. She met and fell head over heels for a handsome man from her homeland, Rocco de Nino. They quickly cemented their union and became husband and wife. Just when it seemed she could put the ordeal behind her and enjoy wedded bliss, Fino reappeared to torment her again, 
this time sending her blackmail letters threatening to tell her husband of their relations. Catherine decided to ignore the letters, but soon her husband received one, and finally her friends and family also received them. This caused great strain on their marriage. The young couple decided to leave New York for Evanston, Illinois, to escape Fino's harassment. Rocco was more concerned that his older brother Pascal would find out about the stain on Catherine's honor. This, he felt, would be a disgrace for his family. The couple had a huge argument about this, and Rocco ordered her to leave. Heartbroken, she found herself homeless, loveless, and destitute. She wrote Rocco a letter informing him, Unless you send me $30 right away, I'll put my cards on the table face up in front of your brother. Presumably he did so, because soon after, Catherine traveled to Chicago to buy a handgun. With hardened resolve and now packing a pistol, she used the remaining money to travel to New York and rent a room. Once there, she started looking for the man who had ruined her life. Catherine pursued her target for days, even donning dark glasses to disguise herself in case he spotted her before she was ready. She received information from a mutual acquaintance that Fino went to the same barber every week. She decided to lay in wait and ambush him. On November the 13th, 1926, she arose early and left her hotel room, telling the clerk she would be checking out. She jumped on a streetcar and headed to the address which her acquaintance had provided, along with the tip that Fina would be making an appearance that day. There, she waited nine hours outside the barber shop to confront the man who had caused her so much misery. He finally turned up, totally unaware that the desperate and unhinged Catherine was about to provide long-awaited justice. He was just about to enter the premises when she called out his name. Spinning round, his last moment would be seeing the young girl whose life he had wrecked, suddenly transformed into this outraged woman pointing a gun at him. She allowed him a few seconds to register his fate, and then, as he was about to make a run for it, she started firing. The first shot hit him in the chest, the second as he lifted his arm to shield himself. As he lay on the ground with his blood darkening the pavement and twitching in death throes, she came over to stare in his face, and then fired a final fatal shot. In despair, she then put the gun to her own mouth, ready to end her life. 
but the last bullet jammed and she just stood there in forlorn shock. When a crowd started to gather around, she could be heard repeating in a small lost voice, He broke my doll. Witnesses reported that three women had passed out upon witnessing the shocking scene. Fino, whose life was draining out into the gutter, was put into an ambulance where he died on the way to hospital. Catherine was put in handcuffs, declaring indignantly to the arresting officers, Whatever they do with me, I'm glad I shot him. She was taken to jail and placed in a cell by herself. Again, she asserted to the police on duty, I killed him and I'm sorry I killed him, but I am not sorry he is dead. Above the roar of the street rose the staccato bark of a pistol. This was how a newspaper headline dramatically described the shooting. With the terms of the law as written at that time, Catherine faced the electric chair, and she was to be held without bail. With a full confession and the revolver which officers had taken from Catherine, it looked like a clear-cut case of cold-blooded murder. That is, until Fino's blackmail letters were turned over to the police. Soon the public found out the circumstances and were outraged, and the majority believed Catherine was justified in her actions. Soon the press was publishing statements from Catherine, unashamedly declaring, He was frightened when he saw me and started to run away. Thank God he saw me shoot him. To determine her state of mind at the time of the shooting, Catherine was submitted to the psychiatric ward at Bellevue Hospital for evaluation. She was declared unbalanced by psychiatrists. The fight was far from over, but she had support from the public, celebrities and prominent political figures. As the trial commenced, Louis Fino's body lay unclaimed in the morgue for nearly two weeks. It was misreported where he was to be buried to ensure his grave was not desecrated. Sophie Loeb, the president of the Child Welfare Committee of America, testified on Catherine's behalf eloquently, saying to the judge, Too long has the girl been brought forward in the court and made to pay the penalty of the deed. Let it be known that at least in this court, the man has been tried and found guilty for the crime of murder rather than the woman. Harry K. Thor, heir to millions and husband of Evelyn Nesbitt, whose case I previously covered, wrote a blank check for Catherine's defense, expecting to spend up to $5,000. Her case is so much like my own, said Thor. Other prominent names like lawyer Dorothy Fuchs Esquire and Margaret Woodrow Wilson, daughter of the late United States President, came forward to ask the judge to show mercy and attended court hearings in support of Catherine.
During research for the trial, Dorothy Fuchs discovered astounding information that the baby that Catherine had with Fino had been adopted by an aged childless couple in New Jersey. The child Catherine thought was dead had been found and brought to her cell. When they presented the young boy to her, it was noted Catherine could show no affection for him. I only saw it for a moment and I was too young to remember it. I had suffered too much. How can I feel any love for it? It was further revealed to the court that Catherine was expecting another child, which is part of the reason why she was so grief-stricken when she was thrown out on the street by her husband. While Catherine was in remand, her husband Rocco had renounced her, as he was worried about the stigma associated with the crime. Catherine believed Rocco would come round and forgive her, but Rocco kept coming up with excuses as to why he could not visit. Later, her lawyer intervened, making a call to Rocco directly, but still he did not show up. Upon hearing this, Catherine said, I've suffered so much, I don't care if I live or die. Eventually, in December, Rocco realized his mistake and became joyful about the baby she would soon deliver. Laden with Christmas gifts, he visited his loyal and long-suffering Catherine. This lifted her spirits immensely. She cried, All my life I have never known a happy Christmas. This one will be my happiest. Also around this time, the court proceedings were nearing an end, and the public fully expected the trial to be dismissed. When it was the time for the verdict to be read, all present were quiet. The judge looked at Catherine and said, I do not condone your act. Your act was criminal. But the court feels the law has been vindicated by your plea. Let it be known, though, that you stand before the world a confessed and acknowledged felon. With these words, he showed leniency to Catherine, and she avoided the death penalty and a jail sentence. The judge ordered her to be remanded to the supervision of a probation officer. As another condition of her release, the judge demanded that she was not to go to her mother's home under any circumstances. With these final words, the judge announced her freedom. I want you and your husband to return to your home and start life afresh. Sentence is suspended. Catherine was barely able to control her sobs of happiness. Mrs. Loeb, the president of the Child Welfare Committee, formally asked that this case be held as a precedent to stand for other judges as pattern for similar cases. Harry K. Thor was the first to shake her hand as she walked free from the court. A beaming Catherine said to reporters, I feel better now. Maybe someday I can be happy. Catherine returned home with her beloved Rocco. Their time together thereafter was one of serene happiness. They had two more children and enjoyed a long and happy life. Towards the end of their days, they retired to Florida. It is not known whether she ever saw her firstborn son again. In a letter that she had penned to her husband from the prison cell during the trial, she made it very clear her fierce loyalty to him. I have washed with blood the stain on our honor.
Well, my dear friends, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. What do you think? Would Catherine have got off nowadays? I think most likely it would have been probably a case of diminished responsibility. The fact that she was talking about her broken doll at the actual crime scene uh, shows that her mind was probably unhinged, though she recovered herself quite quickly, didn't she, it appeared. But um, I think she's very lucky back then that she had such prominent support because uh, I don't think... Uh, I don't think the juries back then, or the judges for that matter, were so lenient in such cases. It was, to all intents and purposes, an execution. Um, yeah, but uh, she obviously had mitigating circumstances, the fact that he had raped her, and that had really, uh, yeah, unhinged her to the degree, uh, and the fact that her husband had thrown her out, and uh, the dishonor thing for the, for the Italian family, um, all these factors came together and the fact that she had such support. If it wasn't for the support and the case had not received publicity, it probably would have been a different matter. She might have been sent down to do hard time, as they say. I think nowadays judges are much more aware of such uh, cases. It's not clear-cut murder. It was done out of desperation. But I'd like to know your, your, your thoughts on this. I would like, I can hear my dog tapping. It must be getting near lunchtime. Her, her, her toenails tap on the floorboards. <laughs> I'd like to know your thoughts on this. Um, do you think Catherine deserved to be let off or do you think she should have been uh, punished in some way? Let me know what you think. I found it very interesting that the judge ordered that she was not to go anywhere near her mother. So the judge obviously thought that the mother had a very negative influence on Catherine's life. Their details are missing. Why? Why do you think? Why do you think the mother had a negative influence on on Catherine's life? We don't know the full details, but obviously the judge knows or knew something that we don't know. Mind you, the her husband was a bit of a weak character, wasn't he? You know, not not supportive at all. Threw her out on the street uh, just because of some some uh, misplaced sense of honor. He was actually the one that was dishonoring her by not supporting her. He should have went out and shot the bastard. Oh, excuse me, I didn't say that. Yes, I think that, that the fact that he threw her out in the streets, that was the final straw that broke the camel's back. That's what drove her to this uh, desperate act. Um, she thought in that way she could prove to her husband that she loved him. Uh, he should have took a more assertive part in, in this whole thing. I'm not sure what he could have done, but he could have punched the bugger in the face or something, but he didn't really, he just stepped back and stepped away from her, which was uh, very unfortunate for Catherine. Anyway, I would love to hear your, your comments, what you think about the whole case, and uh, I'm ahead now with these videos, which is great. It sort of gives me, a, I don't feel so stressed, you know, when I was always trying to catch up and make sure that I got them out on time. I'm actually ahead, uh, I hope it stays that way. So, uh, you know, by the time that you see this video, Christmas is already starting to loom. We're already into um, the start of uh, December. So, uh, who knows? The world may have ended. Maybe my transmission is going out into the uh, black hole somewhere. No one's actually listening. <laughs> I'm talking rubbish, aren't I? Well, let's hope the world hasn't ended. Well, it's been a strange year, hasn't it? Huh? What a strange year. Let's hope 2021 is better. Well, I've got a few things. Hopefully, I will have a few things happening if I'm still around uh, on YouTube and Patreon. Uh, something funny for YouTube. Uh, probably have an early release on Patreon. <laughs> but it's something I've never done before and I'm not likely to do again. I just hope I get it finished in time. I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag. You just have to wait and see, but um, it's it's a laugh. It's I've done it for a bit of a laugh, for a bit of Christmas cheer to brighten up the end of 2020. Uh, hope you enjoy. <laughs> I hope you enjoy it. Yeah, I can't tell you anymore. You just have to. You just have to wait. It's a bit of light humour, anyway. But along with the normal historical uh, cases, which I will be presenting to you, of course, my dear patrons. Well, I'm going to sign off now. Uh, I can't really think of anything else to say, and there's no current events uh, yeah, regarding this channel that I that I can think of at the moment. So I will say tutty bye. Probably once I've closed the edit and signed off, there's something will pop into my head. That's the way it is, isn't it, my dear, my dear viewers? 
but thank you as always for your beautiful support and uh, and for being here with me throughout 2020 we'll see you soon take care my dear oddites and god bless bye bye <laughs>